No, it's not. Yeah, so you can still use your account, but it's gonna, when you click the link, it's gonna ask for your access code for this class. And then you just look at my email. I gave you, I sent you an access code. You just copy and paste it in there and then activate your account. So it will tie that access code to your existing account. Yeah. And then it, sometime in the process, it's gonna ask you to log in, right? After you validate your access code, so after that, you can still log in a year from now and be able to still access it, okay? All right, so let me get captioned because I always forget to do that. And then same thing on this side. Okay, so if we are doing extra credit um, on Friday, this Friday, we're going to have the session for CTE day. So this week, we're going to talk a little bit about cryptography. This is, you know, um, very important in this particular field because everything that we use have some form of encryption. So we are going to do a lab that has two components. One is going to be the certificate and the other is going to be the encryption. So I'll show you how you can encrypt both ways. And we are going to work with files and folders today. Okay. So let me download. Oh, I forgot it's edge. No, they were just in here earlier because I asked them to check an app, but I will remind. He said that he's going to re-image after the semester anyway, so probably not during the semester because it might cause disruption. So yeah, I know. I got to write that on, on the list of him uh, for him to do. Okay, so make sure that we copy and paste our VM onto the desktop, and when you're done, you clone it back to or copy it back to your drive. That will be the easiest way. Um, so we are going to work with a few things today. Today, we're going to work with manage, Microsoft Management Console. And I hope that every lab that you go through, you write down, you make a list of the things that we learned so you can add it to your resume. It's important that you do that so you don't forget. So we're going to, in the last couple of weeks, we work with Windows 10 because I... We mostly work with Linux before, right? And then we will we will move into the server area that in in the next lab, or actually in a couple of labs. Um, we only have about one or two more labs, and then I'll give you time to prepare for your final and work on your practice exam. So in Microsoft Management Console, this is a way that we can manage the configuration for your Windows system. Um, three things that you need to kind of know about the environment of MMC is that the local computer is going to be for the local device, like your computer, your desktop or your laptop or anything that the user used to log in that could also be their smartphone. Then you have the current user that will be pertaining to the user account, right? That they use to log into the network. Now, some company they would use um, virtual machines instead of the actual hardware, like a, a desktop or a laptop. So they would require profiles that's going to be carried across. Then they have service account. And this is used to service the device. IT people use this a lot. Um, we use it to be able to configure the device in the background and also manage the device for security reasons. So what you need to do is you once you copy your, your folder onto your desktop, you're going to open up your VM and then double click the VBox blue icon to start, or you can browse through it through the VirtualBox app. Then once you got it started, right, you logged in and the login account for the one that I created is this. If you're using your own, make sure you remember your account. 
If you forgot, then you likely have to use to create one or use the one I created. Every, anybody okay? Everybody's good here? Any questions? Would we'll log in? Okay, so by this time we should be good, right? <laughs> And so you, so instead of using cloud environment, I use virtual machine a lot. This is the nature of this particular field is how, this is how you test. So what you're gonna do is once you're on your desktop and logged in, you are gonna search for MMC for Microsoft Management Console. You're gonna see this red toolbox. So on an interview, they might ask you, how do you configure your Windows system? Let's say for security accounts or to be able to work with certificate. And you would tell them, you know, I can go to Microsoft Management Console, which is how I would run MMC, right? And this is the same thing as you see on the server, but the server has a server manager, it's slightly different. So this is the firewall, hello. It's gonna ask you yes or no, of course we're gonna allow. So this is gonna pop up. Now, on the root, you see nothing. Think of this as a blank canvas. So what we're going to do is we are going to um, add in the tools that we need. So we're going to go to File, Add or Remove, Snap-in, right? File, Add or Remove, Snap-in. Now, once you're, you added the tools that you need to your toolbox, which is your Microsoft Management Console, you can save it. So that way you can use it later. Right, so this pops up and these are all the, the management options that you can include, right? Or add in or add as a snap in into that. So I am at step two. I click file and I select add or remove snap in after I search for MMC and it will look like this. Then what you're gonna do is you are going to click on certificate because we're gonna work with this today and I'll explain why, okay? So certificates is here and you're gonna click add and it's gonna ask you. So at the beginning, remember what I told you, we have your user account, we have the computer account and we have the service account. So normally if you're configuring for your user account, you keep it as default. So in this case, we are gonna select computer account and then you're gonna go next. So we're gonna go computer account, the third option, and we're gonna go next, okay? Again, I open MMC, let me start again, right? I click on file, add or remove snap in, I chose certificates, I click add, and this pops up, choose computer account, go next. And then here is where I'm gonna choose the local computer. That means I'm configuring for this current system that I'm on, which is my virtual machine. Now, if you are using, if you're doing this for the network computer, you're gonna select this option and you're gonna browse to the network computer, okay? So this is how we can remotely configure another system. But for today, we're gonna to click the local computer and then we are going to click finish and then we're gonna add another tool. So it's gonna look like this. Uh, I'm sorry, you're gonna click okay. So we're gonna do finish and then we're gonna click okay. So this is gonna pop up and you're gonna click this little arrow on the left to expand and you can always pull this to the right, right? Now on the left, you're gonna have the hierarchy menu or options in what we can do with the certificate. So certificates are used to allow the system to be trusted by another system, right? So for example, if I am installing a certificate on my smartphone, I would, enable certain permissions like turning on camera, turning on microphone, things like that. On the system, the administrator would need to configure what that certificate means. What does it require? How long it's gonna last? You're gonna, you use certificate for most of the, all the things that are encrypted. So when you're authenticating to a website that's using HTTPS, right? You're using an SSL certificate. 
And that certificate allows you to have an encrypted session when you log in on that particular secure website. So once we're here, what we're gonna do is we are gonna click on the Trusted Root Certification Authority and then click on Certificates. So once we're here, right, we're gonna click the second option from the drop down, this one, and then click the certificate. So on here, what I'm saying is this is the certification authority. So it uses an entity to be able to issue the certificate for that system, right? And, or in create a certificate for itself. So what we want is we want to be able to configure a specific certificate that we need when we go here. But you do have other level of certificates. So I hope that when you go through this, it's very similar to the other ones. You just gotta read the type of templates that's giving you a certificate. So once I'm here, right, you are going to click on certificate and then you are going to see how many certificate you can manage under the trusted root certification. So this is your root CA. Often that they, you know, when you see the job description, it would say manage certificate, configure certificate, uh, um, CA authority. This is where it is, okay? So here, right, on the right-hand side, you on the bottom, I see that there's 18 certificates that is created in this directory for the trusted CA, the trusted root CA. Okay, so you can put down your answer here. And where do I look? On the bottom right here of my MMC. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna view the certificate and the expiration date. So what I can do is I can go through here, right? Let's say that I click this one and I double click, it's gonna tell you the validity date or the expiration date. It's gonna say valid from this to date, this, right? Some certificate will last for years, some would only be for days or hours. So once I click this, hello, yeah, I, I can double click to view my, my certificate. So let's see if we have any kind of expire certificate. So you kind of have to go through and take a look, right? This one is still 2028, my Microsoft one. So look at this one, right? So I clicked the copyright 1997 Microsoft certificate. This was already expired. That was in 1999. So that one you can track, right? So yes, but it says that, it says on here, the certificate has expired or not yet valid. So in this case, we know that we cannot use the certificate, right? Normally, right, we would be able to see this from the logs, but we can create another certificate for it. So this one is, right? And sometimes you would have vendor that issued this. So Microsoft issued this and it's expired for the, the old licenses probably. Okay, so we saw one. Let's see if we have, we see another one. The root CA should be a while, right? So all of these, you're gonna see that they're gonna go for quite a bit. So you can double click and take a look. Yeah, go ahead. So the only one I saw so far was the 1997 copyright one. Oh, here's another one. The Microsoft authentication, the root CA for authentication, that one expired in 1999. That's probably tied with this one, the, the third, and then this one. So part of auditing is to look at the certificate that you have expired. You have to double click and view the valid date. It says it ends in 1999. That was a while back. Some of you might not even born in that time, right? <laughs> so a lot of these are gonna go for a while. Oh, here's another one, 2020. 
So issue by my, so the root authority for Microsoft. So this one, and also the expiration column, right? You don't have to double click. You can also see the expiration column. It tells you, yeah, that's good. 2021 here. Okay. So we can pull this to the right a little more. So if you look right here, you're going to see there's one, two, three, four. And then another one, no liability accepted. That's 2004. And then the thought, uh, the timestamp CA, that one is also expired. So those, you can identify them. So we can put down how many, you just need to count and then put down the two that you identified, right? Just look at the expiration or the valid date. So the purpose of this is to show you what kind of certificate exists. A lot of the times we manage certificate from a server end and not the local system end, right? Um, you will do a lab either in this class or in 40A that you will have to create or manage a CA from a server. Okay, so then what we're gonna do is you're gonna click the, the you're gonna double click the first certificate and then you're gonna write down the purpose. So the point in this is to show you how you can see a certificate if you need to go in and look at it, right? So I click the Baltimore Cyber Trust route, okay? And then the purpose. So you can put summarize this. You don't have to put everything down, but we want to be able to say remote identity of, uh, ensure identity of remote computers. So basically this is used for what? authentication right because when you or access access is about identifying authenticating accounting right so the quadruple a okay so put down the information that it provides you here don't have to put verbatim kind of summarize it that's good So think of this, certificates are files that the system rely on to be able to perform based on criteria. Um, so for example, when you're installing a game, it gives you a certificate and it needs to access different hardware devices. So that will be what it's going to be listed, right? Permission, it has to request. Or in some certificate, it needs to work with the browser and sometimes browser privacy requirements, right? To be able to send your data across. Especially right now, because the compliance, when you build apps or when you manage certificate for organization, for web, you have to really, really look at the state regulation and the federal regulation on how right, we share information of the user or we exchange or um, forward or even sell, right? So because all of that has to be within the policy that the user accepts. And then you also have to allow the user to opt out. So this is why when you're installing an app, it's gonna tell you allow or disallow only for this app, right? Or the entire system. So you have different level and permission that needs to be incorporated for the certificate. Okay, and then check out the issue date and the expiration date. Look at the valid date. I put down the hints for you there. Now, we also wanted to see who signs this. Sometimes it comes from the third party, um, like the website or the web application. So we want to look at the details for the certificate. So when you click the details date, it's going to tell you the issuer here. Right, and remember what I said about how certificate ties with encryption, you would see the algorithm, the hash algorithm and the signature algorithm that's used with that certificate. So think of certificate as like this. You need to access a secret area, right? And in order to access the secret area, you have to have this file. And that file is going to tell you how you're going to access and what you're going to access when you get inside that secret area. And that's exactly what certificate does. 
it's a way for the system to refer to it to be able to utilize the type of encryption algorithm and all the correlated components for that encryption. So for example, right? Usually, so you see SHA here, right? It's using a hash algorithm for this certificate, uh, for, for this encryption. And so you would know that this certificate is pertaining to, hi, to the encryption, right? For this particular, this particular issuer. Now, most web application that uses HTTPS for distribution or access, you're gonna see some form of certificate through SSL or TLS, okay? All right, and then it also tells you the key and the key identifier, how the key is used, right? Remember that this is a file that's gonna to pertain to that secret area. And in order to access it, you have to have the key right, sometimes multiple keys, and so on. Okay. Any question? So whenever that you're using biometrics on your iPhone or your smartphones, act, that actually has a certificate itself. Yes. Say it louder. <laughs> Okay, so I'll get there in a second. Are you on the next, the PowerShell part? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, okay. So once we take a look at the key information, put that down, and then the certification path, right? All of that is on your certificate information, which is right here. So it's going to tell you what that is, right? Did you serve multiple groups? And then the status. It says it's okay. So, and if it's not or it's expired, it'll tell you that too. Okay, so once we're there, we're going to close MMC. So, now I want, I encourage you to go through and take a look at the others, right? Sometimes there's none that's built but you can take a look. Mostly you're gonna see either trusted root or the enterprise level. Um, sometimes you have to create certificates or is getting issue a certificate. So we are gonna go ahead and close our, this is where you can save, right? If you want to use it later, you can save it with the name or console one. So I'm not. Now we are going to go ahead and type in CMD. Very important that you do run as administrator. Otherwise it's gonna give you permission deny. So once you search for CMD, you're gonna right click and choose run as administrator. So if you miss this step, this step you have to redo and click yes. Again, we have to do run as administrator, otherwise we're gonna get stuck. And I know you guys love PowerShell. <laughs> okay, so on this level, this is not the shell, this is command prompt, right? What I do is I normally teach you multiple ways to be able to access this on the command line, on a PowerShell and on the GUI or the graphical user interface. So we're here. Let me change the font a little bigger. And we are going to type insert util space dash user dash store. Let me move this so you can see this together. It's giving you
Well, one second, let me redo that. Dash V, dash user, so we have that correct. Dash store in my, let's see if it doesn't, okay. So no space, no space, or util, dash user, dash store in my. So what you're doing here is um, you are, saving you're using the user option if you look right so anytime that you modify anything in windows system this is going to change the registry key on the actual os and register key pertains to configuration for software and hardware so whenever that you installing a hardware and you run the driver it changes right, the key value in the system. So later on, when you guys get to the forensic class, we'll touch back on this. So in the case where if the user installs something or they delete something, they modify something, we can find everything in registry key, which is cool, okay? But digging into it, you have to kind of look. So, it's so anytime that the user modify anything, in this case, I'm storing a certificate so it creates, it modified the value for my registry key. So whenever you see H key like this, that's a value. Yes. Yeah, that's all you need. So what you're going to do is it's, it tells you how many certificates listed one, right? And then view the first certificate. Oh, yeah. So. I think they modified this. Hold on one second. Do SID. Give me a second. Let's look at the help option real quick. So you can type in dash question mark. It's going to give you like more details or more options or switch that you can use, right? Um, dump certificate store in Grok, verify attestation. Yeah, so when we did the store, it should give us more, maybe because it's just, okay. Let me see if there's another way that we can find. You can probably do a dash view. Okay, give me a second. Let me modify that. I probably have to fix this. User. Yeah, it's not able to get. I'll help in verbs get roots. Verify keys. Store in new store. Enumerate certificate stores. Enum stores. So let's try that and see if it's it loops through it. And for those of you who knows programming, okay. Okay, do this. Instead of using this, use enum store.
So this is a enumeration function and store is what it store as certificate. So you would be able to see a bunch of different certificates. So earlier, remember how we looked at there's 18 on the, the, the CA? It's exactly that, but on the command level, okay? So you can put count this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, eighteen. Just like what we've seen before. So the zero, the first certificate is going to be the my personal, that's the one that you just created. So we can say 18 here. And then that's my personal is the one that we made. Right? I think we have to go a little deeper if we want to see the issuer, if we're using enum. So you can skip this one. Let me see. If if I can get the details. Get entry, add chain, get key, display object or ID six. CA information. Yeah, so it's not la letting me pull some of the stuff. It's giving me like a, a memory error. So the function failed to be called there. Okay. So for this one, answer these two is okay. Hello, how are you doing? Working on part A. Okay. I'm trying to troubleshoot the command. Display enrollment CA. Let's see. So you can play with the actual options. Yeah, see, even if, so I was trying to pull some information and for some reason it's failing. Possibly that it's not having everything installed. So we can answer these two, but Coming back to this, right? Anytime that you use cert util, at the end, you have to answer some question like, what did I learn today, right? If you need the help option, do dash question mark. That's usually, or usually it's slash question mark, but this one dash question mark. And you would get all the options that you need for the basic access for the cert util. So in case if I need to create, delete, stuff like that, Right, command level is a little bit more tedious, but we need to know how to do this if we only have command line. So number 16, I did modify it a little bit and we could only answer this first one. So I'll, I'll fix this down the line. Um, and then what you're gonna do is you are going to access PowerShell. So we're done with command prompt. We can close the small X here. Right, and then keep in mind that you always want to do run as administrator because that's like gonna give you the higher privilege. 
So here I'm going to go ahead and search for PowerShell, right click, run as administrator. Allow it, yes. So this is similar to command prompt, but it doesn't work with all the, it, ha it doesn't have all the same commands, okay? All right, so let's pull this down now. And then we're going to do a DIR cert, make sure our slash is current user. So I think they updated this now, let me see. It's not going to give you the, it's not going to give you the actual listing for the certs. Let me see. Partial help. Get process. Update. Mm -hmm. No, it's just going to give you, it's supposed to give me the content of that directory and it's not letting me see it. I think that Microsoft changed this to set and get um, for the function. Yeah, because all this is, is it's gonna, it's supposed to allow you to view this directory. Okay, let me see. Let's, let me view it like this, okay. So let's go see it, because it's supposed to open it up like that. So open your, your file explorer for the next step right here. And we are going to go to app data. And then we're gonna go uh, for Microsoft. System certs. And I, why? Yeah, so it didn't give you anything because it's empty. <laughs> yeah. So we want to verify because earlier, right, when we did the DIR, it just shows nothing, right? It just goes here. So basically, when you do do this, you are viewing the same content as this. So when I go here, I'm looking at the, the my personal certificate, right? And it doesn't have anything yet. So it tells me that my folder is empty. So when you do investigation sometime, let's say that you do forensic, you have, when you open things up, it changes the timestamp. So we don't normally go in, we have to take an image of this and we open a virtual machine and we run the Windows image, but you can view their certificate. So for example, if someone accessed the website to commit fraud or they send out information or let's say they exchange it on the dark web um, or they use some kind of secure browsing session, it would show the certificates here and it would show the time that they use it. So you would be able to see at least the services that they use to be able to funnel out the data or leak data. Um, and then you, you have to go in and pull registry key information. Remember the H key local stuff that we saw earlier? So you have to build a case based on all the evidence that you find, right? But in our case, when I did the DIR earlier, right, it shows me nothing. It just like goes to the next line is because the content is empty. Now, if I have certificates, so when I wrote this lab, I wrote it on my laptop. And so it is 
slightly different in that I have a bunch of certificates created, yeah. right? So when you try this at home, when you run it on your home Windows PC, you might get a little bit different output than our virtual machine that's kind of blank slate or it doesn't have too much stuff on it, okay? So keep in mind that, and Microsoft does a really good job at documenting their PowerShell and it does change. So you want to go in and take a look at the documentation to get more. So take a screenshot, that's good. And then you can put zero here of the output. This, the, 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 the folder, the empty, it says that, oops, I'm on the, yeah, this. Um, I'm, so you type this in, I'm on 22. And then on the PowerShell, you just take a screenshot of just the PowerShell. It's running that, that, right? Now, when you run this on a different system, it's going to show it a little differently if it has certificates. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So here, right, I want to screenshot this so I can do a snip. Or I can just do like this, and then I can just take this like this and then paste it into the lab. And then on the next part, once I put in, so when I did step uh, step 21 and 22, I simply go and open up my file explorer, which is the folder, right? And then I type in the path. So. I think I defined it without mapping the current uh, user. The current user? Yeah, without. Okay, my, without using my. Uh -huh. Yeah, so sometimes, but current user just pertaining to your login. Yeah, so you're right. So it might not be be under, so what what he's saying, Gabino is saying this. Uh, yeah. So if you do DIR with just the current user, mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, I'm missing a colon. Make sure we put a colon. Yeah, it's it's listing all the, but see, it did create a directory for this by default. It's just listing all the, the directory that would contain your certificates, right? So if you want to go to um, this, and then let me see under root to see. Yeah, so in the root, you would see more, see? Just unfortunately, the my doesn't have anything, so it doesn't show anything. But if you do the root, you would see all of those. So when you look at this, you're going to say, this is your C name. So this is who is issuing your or authorizing your certificate, like basically the vendor. Okay. And then the thumbprint for that certificate. Basically, it's unique identification. Yeah, you can try root instead of my and you will see more. But for you, right, in order to view this, you can look at current user and these are the directory that contain the certificate. Just like how we see earlier, we click the folder and it gives us the drop down, right? Some doesn't have anything, some has certificates underneath. And so when you do the current user, it basically lists the folder. And then when you go into the subfolder, when you click on it, it just expands it. And this is what it gives me, right? So questions? Yeah, earlier when we try my, my doesn't have anything. So it shows nothing. You can try the root. 
So let me modify this for the future students. If you try the root, that works better. Okay. Yeah. What's what happened? You did the same thing and it's giving you more? No, I'm Oh, say it again. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't I didn't follow. It's all right. You can say. No judgment. So now later on when we when we work with the enterprise stuff, right? We'll talk about organizational unit what that pertains to in a hierarchy of the network, right? So these are just container. Remember the one 1997 one, the expired one, we see that here too, when you look at the root, right? Just like before. So you can view this in here, you can view it in GUI, or you can view it in command prompt. There are many ways that you can access it, okay? All right, questions? Okay, so that wraps up like the certificate things that I want to kind of show you in Windows. So after this, you should be able to know where or how you will be able to access certificates, right? Interview questions, MMC, right? PowerShell, you would use the, the DIR cert to look at your cert directories, and then you can go in within by just putting in the path for your folder or your directory. Okay, let's talk about EFS. EFS stands for encrypted file system, right? Make sure we remember that. This is used by Microsoft for file and folder encryption. This is specifically pertained to NT file system technology. That means that any operating system that's formatted with NTFS would allow to use EFS. And EFS is only used for file and folder encryption. Now, how do we encrypt drive? Anyone know on Windows 10 or 11 or 7? What do we use to encrypt the entire drive? Let's say I want to encrypt my USB drive. What, what do I use? A plus question, people. Come on. BitLocker. Very good. BitLocker, and that comes with Windows Pro and Enterprise only. I mentioned this last time, right? So EFS is for file and folder, and BitLocker is for the entire drive, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we are going to look at the Service Manager console. You can use this in my Microsoft Management Console, or you can simply search for services. Let me close this. So here it tells you all the services that's either running or not running in your system, right? So when should I use this, you think, in security? When should I use Services Management Console? Here's BitLocker. When should I use this? When should I check services on your system? When do you do that? Yes, when something's failing, when something is taking over your system, like malware, when something is, uh, when you, you're verifying certain things are working properly, right? There are many ways that we would use this for. So we can use this to check encryption so when you click on the name tab, you're gonna be able to sort. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this, right? We can sort it ascending right now. It starts with ascending, or we can sort it by descending by clicking it again. So what we're gonna do is we are going to look for um, EFS. Here's EFS. And you notice that as it's not being used, it's not started. There are certain things that's already started when the operating system is on, like this one, DCOM, data usage, data sharing services, um, the HCP client. Why do I need this? 
DHCP client, why do I need that? So the dynamic host control protocol, this is used to get what kind of address? IP. IP address. So in order to access the internet, I have to have an IP. So it give, I am a client, so I need to obtain IP here. Right here's the DNS client. I need to access the domain. I can authenticate. So it's automatic. It's not fully running, right? But it, it is running, but you can join it to the domain. It's not fully integrated. Okay. Exactly. Right. So the HTTP client allows you to obtain an IP address from the server. So we are using, right? A, a DHCP server to obtain. So how do I do that? Well, on your virtual box, you have a NAT network address translation option. What that does is it takes your virtual machine and it allows it to connect to, you know, RCCD network by translating the address to the network that's, that we're connecting to. Just like at home, when all your system at home uses NAT, because it funnels into that router and that router takes all the addresses, convert it to one public IP address and send it out. And it gives you the internal address. It's kind of like at home, everybody knows you as a nickname, right? But at the door, once you leave that door, you have a formal name so that the public IP. So what that does is when you leave that, you're, to go into the public street, you're going to get everybody acknowledge you as that, that person from that resident, right? So now all the services that are running is logged here, okay? There's also a log that we can check, but if you ever need to find services on Windows, you type in services, it gets you here. So we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at EFS. Now on here, what you're gonna see is it's on the tab, you're gonna see the startup type. The reason why I want you to take a look at this is Sometimes you are going to have issues or um, security issues that would tell you how it started, right? We have to go and find out, okay? So on the general here, right, this, this is the startup type is manual. Now, some of the things you saw that it's automatic for the DNS or sometimes it's delay start or disable. So if I need to stop it, I turn it on to disable. Okay, that means I turn it off, okay? But right now it's on manual. That, that means that I have to click start in order for it to start or in, I have to click encrypt for it to start. So when you encrypt in the later step, it's, that means you manually start it, okay? All right, so now if it's manual, right? We are, it cannot be set for files and folder. So we're gonna change this to automatic and automatic requires you to reboot, okay? So that's what I put here. So in Windows PC, so what we're gonna do is we are going to create a folder and we're gonna encrypt that folder. I normally recommend you manage everything in a folder or directory for any system. And then you throw objects into it because if you start encrypting file, it's gonna inherit the property of the folder, the parent, so you're gonna end up doing double the work. So what I do is I create a folder, I put a bunch of files in it and I encrypt the folder. And anything in that folder will be encrypted. It inherits the container that it's in. It's kind of like you have characteristics of your inheritance, which is your family, right? So you just need to set the characteristic for that container. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and open up your file explorer. It tells you here. Yeah, you can set it to automatic. Let's do that. It's gonna require reboot, but I think you should still be okay um, having it manual. I think you should be fine. So it says that proceed to the next step. If the manual EFS cannot be set for files and folder, change the setting requires the system reboot. So I'm gonna try it without setting it to manual so, or, or automatic, we'll see. So let's do desktop 
we're going to go ahead and make a new folder. We're going to call this test one, right? And then we're going to right click the folder, go to properties. Here it tells you you are, so once you create your folder, right, you're going to go to the properties of that folder. You are going to click the advanced button. And then you're going to click encrypt. So at this point, when we select like this, remember that it was manual, right? We're going to click OK and then apply. And now it's it's the service is running for that, right? So when you manually set it, what that means is that you have to click it to in order for it to, to run. When you do it automatic, sometimes you can have it, you know, the automation with en encryption you know, where you can say, oh, I wanted to do like all of these as a batch, et cetera. You can, you have to set it at automatic. That means you have to reboot. So here, what I have is I have my test folder, right? Nothing is in it yet. Now, Okay, so once it's encrypted, nothing really changed, right? You cannot do both of these together. It won't compress and, and, and encrypt. So compression changes the property of the file in that it, it makes the file, you can see things like make it shrink, right? Smaller, kind of like how, you know, you put things into the those vacuum bag and you suck all the air out of it. It's still the same item. It's just the file property is treated as, a, you know, it's using a smaller storage or it allows you to span it in a smaller storage for that particular file or folder. So you cannot have both of these together. You can only do one or the other. So now what you're going to do is you are going to um, set that. So once we're okay, we set that up and then we, we look at to see if it changes the color. Okay. Oops. Okay, apply, okay. Right now in Windows 7, you're going to see that this changes to a different color. Okay, and then you can go back to it. It's still the same. On Windows 10 and 11, you won't have a different color. It has a lot. Yeah, it has a lot. it should show a little indicator. So put down that you see that it's no, no change in color. That's on, only on Windows 7, but you're gonna have a lock. Right? And then you examine the file that the name, the file name changed. So let's make a file in it. Right, so we can add a file in. So in here, we're gonna go ahead and create new and we can make just like a text document and we're gonna call this test one document, whatever you wanna name it. Right, yeah, so when you create it, you are going to, it automatically inherit the, the folder that it's in. You don't have to, so at this point, I can just make a bunch of files in it and I already know that they it will be encrypted. So we want to manage everything from a container standpoint to kind of streamline the process, okay? Yeah, it shows like a little symbol, a tiny yellow lock, you should see it. Yeah, the folder, it's like right, it's sometimes it's not that visible, but if you make a file, you should be able to see the it tiny. Shows the, it shows the lock uh, on the once you go to properties, but it, it doesn't yeah. show it on the actual. The, right. The right. Behind it. Yeah, sometimes it depends on your view, too. Yeah, you see the, the document inside. You see the little yellow block? 
So on the folder itself, like Microsoft stopped changing it to, you know, to, it used to be like, I think it's green for blue or green for encryption. I forgot on the Windows 7 and prior version. On the newer version, you don't have a change in color, but you have a little lock symbol. Question? Okay. I should take this. So technically, no change in color. Lock is shown. Okay. And then now we're going to use command line again, command prompt. So you are going to make it in command prompt, another folder called test two. Okay, so let's. See on the desktop, you see right here in the folder, you see there's a little lock on your desktop. So it depends on your view, the icon view is always going to show the little lock. So I put that back. Okay, then we're going to go CMD. See my lock? CMD. And then what we want is you can run it as administrator if you like. So let's do that. Yes. And then we're gonna go, we're gonna change directory to desktop. Oh. It's not letting me from my administrator. Yeah, use the regular. I think administrator it won't let you move there unless you have to go back to C and then user and then desktop. It has to be a full pack. So run it as a regular user. Just open it. So CMD and then just click it. Okay. Um, and then do CD desktop. Now in Linux, you have to capitalize because it's case sensitive. Microsoft, you don't. You just do CD desktop. And then you are going to do a make dear test two. Okay. So make directory mkdir space test two for the folder. Right. Nothing happens there. If it's successful, you just get to the next drop pop up. And then you're going to do a dir. So this is equivalent to ls and Linux. So we want to list the directory. And so there's test two, okay? And test one we made earlier through the explore, the file explorer. And then you should see your test two folder. If you don't, then you have to repeat the, the other step. Then we're gonna go into it now. So CD for change directory, test two. So now we're in it. And then you are going to use the echo. You can use other, but in the Microsoft, this is, you know, so we're gonna make a text file called test2.txt and the content, the string that we're gonna append is this line, secret file two, right? So let me scroll up, I'm at 42. So once I'm in the directory, I'm gonna go ahead and use the echo command and put it in quotation mark secret file two. That means that we're gonna append the string or the sentence that you see in quotation and we're gonna point it to the text document test2.txt. If it's successful, then it just go to the next pop-up then we're gonna do a DIR to list the content of our desktop, or I'm sorry, our folder test two, and this is the file, right? So make a folder, make a file, encrypt the folder. That's the task, right? So now after I see this, right, take a note of this, 
we, we see the content, I only have this. You see how these, right? These are just hidden. So one file and then directory, and this is the size. So we are gonna do cipher dash E. And so what it's saying is that it's gonna encrypt the entire directory with the file in it and it's okay. Okay, so cipher dash E, E for encrypt. And if you need to go in reverse, you do cipher command dash D for decrypt. If you have administrator or ownership, right, you should do, be able to do both, right? So in the case, if I'm an employee and I get disgruntled because I didn't get a raise, I just start encrypting a bunch of folder and I quit, right? So the administrator can go in and that happens. <laughs> It's funny, but it happens, yeah. right? Uh, so I quit, and then I said, "Screw them! Uh, I, they can, they can go create the file. I'm gone. See you. Peace out." Right? So what, <laughs> what the administrator can do is they can go in as administrator. They can recover the key, right? Administrator has worldly access, so I just need to log in and be able to in decrypt all those folder myself. <laughs> uh, it's illegal, but you know, I'm gone. I'm gone. The company can sue a lot of the time they don't pursue. But if if let's say that I encrypt the, a lot of files that impact their operation, then they'll sue. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna do DIR again. And you notice that, hey, right? What happened is if you look at the file in at command level, do I see a difference? Do you guys see a difference? No. Not really, right? So at the command level, you have to really look at the property of the file um, because it's not gonna give you the verbose information. It's still the same. Okay, but it does, it did encrypt it earlier, right? So now, right, compared to the output step, does test two folder look different after encryption? No, right? We know that it's not, okay? Microsoft is a little funny in that, uh, depending on your view, you, you would see, right? They added the feature, so in Linux, when you encrypt, it does show a certain kind of uh, a dot, you know, whatever for the encryption tool that you use. Question. Yeah. So when you type cipher and you're in that directory, it will just encrypt that directory slash E? Yes, the slash E for so encrypt. So if you do it in desktop, cipher will just encrypt the entire desktop drive or, or C drive or whatever? Uh, You have to issue it the drive letter. Okay. Mm -hmm. But remember, Microsoft uses BitLocker to encrypt drives. So we don't want to, oh, yeah. it's still, you can treat it as a container, but it's not ideal to do that because, you know, there's things that are in your C drive, including your account that you, you want to be able to access. <laughs> no, you'll be able to boot. It's just, it's just, you have to, you have to generate the key. So BitLocker is an ideal way. So, um, okay. So, yeah. I I don't. I prefer not to use BitLocker. I actually want to use a third party. I recommend BitLocker is not all that secure, but it is good for if you don't have anything. So we're gonna move back to the root directory or the, the original, right? Get out of that existing directory by doing cd dot dot, back to desktop, bless you. And then we're gonna do dir again, right? Um, what I want you to see is that it's not a huge difference from what we've seen before, so no, right? Does it look different after encryption? No, at the command line level, no. And then we're gonna go ahead and now go into Test one. Remember, we encrypted earlier, right? And then we're going to try to decrypt it. Okay. 
So, so if you encrypt it in, in the GUI through EFS, right, um, property, you can still decrypt it in command prompt. That's what I'm trying to tell you there. So it tells me right here that it decrypted the file in end up directory, right? When we use the, the slash D, and then we're gonna go ahead and do go back to desktop again by doing cd dot dot. In Linux, it's just cd, right? And then we're gonna go cd test two, and then we do the same thing, right? We're gonna do cipher decrypt. So cipher slash D to decrypt, and everything is good. Take a screenshot of this for your lab submission, right? So you can see that you decrypted and encrypted. So I hope that you remember how to use command prompt to encrypt and decrypt. It's really easy, cipher slash E, cipher slash D. That's what you learned today. You also learn how to view right, your, your file and folder after you encrypt and decrypt, which does not look different on command line, command prompt compared to graphical user interface, but depending on the view, right, we, we saw that when you're in the desktop view like this, right, you don't see in the, in the hierarchy of the folder, see how I don't see the, the little lock, but, but we, if we go to the actual desktop, we minimize this, we see the lock. You see that, right? So if you encrypt and you open up the file as another user, right, it will not allow you. It will just be like, it will ask for the key or uh, it will be gibberish, non plain text, okay? So we, we talked about EFS on how it's used for file and folder encryption. We also learned about Windows certificate. We can access it three ways. We can go through Microsoft Management Console, which is known as MMC, and we would add the certificates uh, snap on or snap in and be able to access the trust root certificate. We can also use PowerShell and command line to be able to view right, specific folder that has the certificate that you create or templates. Okay, any question? This is a somewhat short, easy lab. And certificates are very important. <laughs> Yeah, So, Chris, I'm going to tell you, they're usually only 99% of the time, there's some form of error, and that's the use case. <laughs> 99%. So, and so it's totally understandable 
in my opinion, because I do that sometimes too on a long day. <laughs> 